many of you know we had a beautiful week this week. The weather was great all week except the day that it was supposed to be good enough to play golf. That was the only day it was overcast and cold. The rest of the week was good. Praise God. Wonderful. Wonder, yeah, she's feeling sorry for me. I appreciate that. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. It's good to be loved. It's good to be loved. I have to serve some of you people today, so you want to be nice to me so that you don't end up with anything in your lap. I'm not a volunteer. I work... I work here I work here because I have to. Hey, open your Bibles with me for just a moment, and then we'll move on. Who is that? Is that my grandson? <laughs> Hallelujah. Open your Bibles with me to Romans chapter 15 and verse 4. We want to just get a little bit of a reminder, uh, you know, as we are about to go back into the book of Exodus for just a few moments again this morning. We were in Exodus last week, and I want to go back there and try to bring that message a little bit uh, further into uh, uh, your, your current revelation. In Romans 15, 4, Paul says, For whatever things were written before, and that would refer to Exodus, among, the, you know, among other things, obviously, were written for our learning. For whose learning? For our learning, Right? that we through the patience and the comfort of the scriptures might have hope. And that word hope means a confident expectation. That, and, and of course, over in 1 Corinthians 10, it also says the things that happened to Israel happened as examples for us, see, and for our admonition, for our teaching, for our instruction as well. So when we look at these things back here, we, we are supposed to be able to extract from them a confident expectation of the goodness of God being manifest in our life. So when he, when he says that we might have hope, that, that immediately tells us that when we look back into the Old Testament, we're not going to bring the law forward. We're not going to bring condemnation forward. We're not going to bring legalism forward because none of that offers us any hope or any confident expectation of good. So when we go back, we have some, uh, we have some definite uh, parameters of what we're going to uh, be looking at when we go back there. So anyway, but he says that the things that were written before were written for our learning. And I just want you to keep that in mind as we go back. And I want to go on, uh, you know, and pick up where we left off last week. If you go back with me just to the, we're just going to pick up the one verse uh, in Exodus chapter 14 before we move on a little bit. Uh, we're going to go to the 30th verse. We, we, uh, we looked at several things in this, uh, in, in this last week. And, and I would just really encourage you to go back and listen to that message if you would. Um, in order to update your, yourself. but So in, in the 30th verse of Exodus 14, it said, So the Lord saved Israel that day out of the hand of the Egyptians. For those of you that weren't here last week, the Egyptians typify all of the manifestations or expressions of death. Remember Pharaoh? That particular Pharaoh was a type, is a type of Satan. Egypt is a type of sin. The condition that man came into, the, uh, and, and then the Bible says that sin and death are cause and effect, and the Egyptians are a type of death. That would mean, that would, that would encompass all of the attributes of death. That would be physical death, you know, uh, spiritual death, it would be sickness, it would be disease, it would be addiction, it would be poverty, it would be bitterness, hatred, all of the behavioral abnormalities that, uh, that the church likes to focus on and make the main issue, all of these things are, are typified in the Egyptians. And so we look and we see here in ver verse 30, and again, go back if you weren't here and listen to it because I think it's a tremendous revelation that will really set you on the road to, to recovery in your life. If you will get a hold of what's being typified for us here, the Red Sea, of course, being the blood of the Lord Jesus, all of this is typical of what took place on crucifixion day. It tells us what God did in Christ for you and me, for all of humanity, no one excluded Remember, this is an inclusion mes message, not an exclusion message. All of Israel, Israel is a type of the world, not of the church. All of Israel came out under the cloud. You see, they came out under the protecting of the Lord. And he, he was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, wasn't he? Okay, and so understand all that. We've, we've been over all that. I don't want to go back at, and do it again. But verse 30, so the Lord saved Israel that day, or saved the world that day, out of the hand of the Egyptians... And Israel saw the Egyptians dead on the seashore. As I told you last week, this has really been one of the real problems in the church. This word saw, saw means to, to perceive and to consider. 
and the church has not consistently perceived and considered the Egyptians, all of the attributes of death, dead on the seashore by the work of the blood of Jesus Christ. And yet 2 Timothy 1, 9 tells us that he abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel, right? And so we have all of these uh, existing manifestations continuing around us in this earth, and we say, well, it can't be true that he abolished death because look at all the sickness and disease. Look at all the premature physical death. Look at all the people dying you know, around us. How can you say he has abolished death? Well, part of it, a big part of it, is the fact that we just have not perceived, understood, and consistently considered these things dead on the seashore by the, by, by the work of the Father himself in our behalf. We just haven't done that. Consider. We, we, what do we do? We consider the circumstances. We consider the situations. We look at the things that are seen, not at the things that are not seen, in reverse of what Paul has told us in 1 Corinthians 5. See, we, we have a tendency... Let me get this thing to stay on. We have a tendency to consider the circumstances rather than to consider the work of the Father and the work of the Lord Jesus, don't we? So this word says Israel saw, Israel perceived, Israel considered. They stood and they examined the bodies to some degree of the Egyptians on the seashore and said, no more will Asan or somebody be involved in my life because here he is dead on the seashore. Right? All right, so... But as I said to you last week, as we kind of wrapped it up, that sin consciousness has been the great deceiver in the church. Sin consciousness is the great deceiver that has actually influenced us into using our God-given authority to, in fact, revive the things that were dead on the seashore. You see, that 31st verse said, Thus Israel saw the great work which the Lord had done in Egypt. Remember, that is typifies sin. And we know that he delivered us from so great a death, Paul said in, in 2 Corinthians 1, 9. He delivered us from so great a death and, 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 and will still deliver us, and, I mean, and is delivering us and will still deliver us. See, Paul made a case for the fact that we had been totally delivered from sin, absolutely delivered from sin. And if we've been delivered from sin, we've been delivered from death by, by virtue of the cause and effect relationship that existed between them. Through one man, sin entered the world. And death through sin. How did death get here? Through sin. Through the one man. See? Well, the Bible also tells us that through one man came justification of life to all men. Through that one act of righteousness, there came justification of life to all men. Isn't that right? Are you with me? Or do I need to say anyway? Okay. Pretend there's a camera back here watching you. <laughs> Hallelujah. So as I said, though, it's sin consciousness. Sin consciousness that has deceived us into consistently, you know, reviving things that were intended to be left dead on the seashore. Remember, we talked about the fact that we have an authority. For instance, Jesus announced that authority to the disciples when he told them to raise the dead. Jesus talked about the fact that as the Father hath li- raises the dead and hath life in himself, even so the Son hath life in himself. And he's given us the authority to give life to whom we will. Now, here's the problem with that. The problem is that we have misused that authority and we have raised up dead things that were intended to be left dead. Does that make sense to you? See, when Jesus destroyed sickness and disease, when Jesus destroyed, you know, abnormal behavioral qualities, when Jesus destroyed all the trespass, uh, all of this on the cross, it was to be left dead. And, you know, for the first, uh, nearly the first century, Many of these things that I'm talking about right now were virtually unknown in the church, in the people who had received the message. But yet they were revived through the application and the teaching of legalism, through the reintroduction of Judaism and Judaistic practice into the Christian church. Many of these things began to be revived once again. Because why? Because of sin consciousness. Judaism revives sin consciousness. And there's a multiple, th- multiple uh, things that now we deal with. We deal with things in the church called generational curses and, and, and demonologies. All of these things refocus us on sin consciousness. See what I'm saying? And so sin consciousness has inadvertently been, been, the, been the culprit. It has been the, the great deceiver that has influenced you and I to where we have felt ourselves, for instance, worthy of sickness and disease again. Worthy. And you know what? I'm using sickness and disease. But remember, this, 
whole teaching is no one takes my life from me. No thing takes my life from me is what Jesus said. We need to realize that what we're talking about here is that none of the effects of death, and we're going to talk about, we're going to enlarge on this understanding a little bit more today. We're not just talking about sickness and disease, but we're using that because I know that speaks right into your understanding. But please grab on to things like 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 previous uh, physical and sexual abuses grab on to things like you know like like uh, poverties and addictions nothing steals your life from you you have authority to lay it down you have the authority to take it up again and my message is to try to encourage you and I to take up again what we have ignorantly laid down because we thought it was part of life's plan for us or something okay getting it Amen, Mike. That's a good preaching, brother. Praise God. All right, so here's the thing. The instruction that Paul said was intended for our learning goes on here in the book of Exodus. And I want to just uh, hit a few high spots here for just a few moments and also in the book of Deuteronomy. And I want to enlarge our revelation of what we learned last week. Now, we saw, as it said in that... um, 13th verse, for the Egyptians whom you see today, you shall see again no more forever. And he had already said to this, the Lord will fight for you, hold your peace, and and stand still and see the, the salvation that the Lord will produce. So Exodus 14 is about what the Lord has done and has displayed. He's displayed himself as their deliverer. He has displayed himself you know, as as the conqueror of sin and death for our learning, as the conqueror of Egypt and the Egyptians in their mindset. All right, so, but now it goes on a little bit, and I want to hit a few more uh, high spots here as we go on. Go with me down to uh, chapter 15. Familiar passage of Scripture, verses 25 and 26. And and will you allow me to do something? Here's what I'd like for you to do. I know I'd like for you to assume, and for some of you this may be a huge assumption, I don't know. Depends on where you've come from and what you've been listening to, I guess. But can we assume the Scriptures to be a declaration of God's commitment to our success? See, where a lot of us have been from, you know, the Scriptures have been assumed to be a declaration of what God would have us do in order to straighten up our relationship with Him or in order to be, you know, or in order to, you know what I'm saying? So let's, let's just do this today. Let's assume that the Scriptures are the Father's declaration of His commitment to our victory and success, to our health, our, whole, our wellness, our, whole, our wholeness in every aspect of our life. Will you do that with me? All right, so let's look at some things. Let's read verses 25 and 26. So Moses cried out to the Lord, and the Lord showed him a tree. And again, I'm leaving a lot of the story out. I hope you'll read some of it and kind of use the types I've given you and understand what he's trying to say to the church today. So Moses cried out to the Lord, and the Lord showed him a tree, which when he cast it into the waters, the waters were made sweet. That ought to be easy. The waters of life, the cross, you know, you ought to be able to pick that one up even if you've never had any teaching in types. Okay, there he made, referring to the Father, a statute and an ordinance for them, and there he tested them, and he said, If you diligently heed the voice of the Lord your God, and do what is right in his sight, give ear to his commandments, and keep all his statutes, I will put none of the diseases on you which I have brought on the Egyptians, for I am the Lord who heals you. All right, now... If you look at the last part of that 25th verse, I'm going to just continue to read out of the New King James for a little bit. And in another couple of scriptures, I'm going to give you some, some better translation out of Young's literal translation. And hopefully that will be up here as well so you can follow me on it. But look at the last few words of verse 25. There he made a statute and an ordinance for them. Here's what I want you to see first of all. He, referring to God, made something for them. Who was it for? It was for them. He made it and it was for them. You get that? Again, you see, sometimes we just got to look at words and consider them a little bit differently than what we've been, than what the mindset has been. You know, the mindset has been something there, you know, he gave them a command to fulfill. That's the way we normally would hear this, but that's really not what's being said. It said he made something for them, right? And I want you to see what's being said here is that he gave himself as the statute and the ordinance. That makes sense to you? He gave himself. Now, again, if you put this over into a new covenant understanding, it makes perfect sense, doesn't it? He gave himself. Isn't that right? Christ died for all, therefore all died. All right? So he gave himself. That's what we're seeing here. So in other words, this is about him 
becoming what they needed. This is not about them (laughs) becoming what he could work with. And see, some of you have been spending your whole life trying to become what he can work with. If you can just become what he can work with in healing, then you will receive your physical manifestation or your emotional release or your release from addiction or whatever it is. See, you've been trying to become something that he can work with and produce the the quality uh, item that he wants to really produce according to this statute that he has commanded you. You hearing me? All right. All right, so he he says, Then I will put none of the diseases on you which I have brought on the Egyptians, for I am the Lord who heals you. Let's just shorten that so you get this. He said, None of the diseases of Egypt, for, or that word means because, none of the diseases of Egypt, because I am the Lord your health. Now remember, I am the Lord who heals you. I've told you this many times before. And again, we're not just focusing on physical healing right now. I'm using this and hoping that you will apply it to every aspect of your redeemed life. Okay? So... I am the Lord who heals you is a rather loose translation. What it says is what? Jehovah Rapha. I started to say Jireh. Jehovah Rapha. Okay? And what that really means is, I am the Lord your health. In other words, healing is not something he does. Health is who he is. And there's a big difference in what he does and who he is. And a big difference to you. Now, does he heal? Yeah, of course he heals. I'm not, but here's the point how it's, why it makes a big difference to you. Because if he is the Lord who heals you, now immediately you have the opportunity to say, well, me, heals me, maybe not you. Heals you, maybe not me. See? Because now we're taking something that he uh, does and we're, that we have the freedom now to begin to apply certain uh, you know, ideas of our own to that. And what happens is we end up eliminating ourselves, don't we? And this passage of Scripture has been real instrumental in helping people make a decision to determine themselves unworthy of healing, as I'll talk about here in just a second. So get this. It says, none of the diseases of Egypt because I am Jehovah Rapha, because I am the Lord your health. Not the Lord who heals you, but I am the Lord your health. Okay, not something he does. It's who he is. And where does he reside? In you, right? All right. Now, he says, I am the Lord your health. Well, you know, in the English, the Lord, the word Lord implies authority. So he's saying, I am the authority of health. I am the authority of health. In other words, the doctor is not the authority. See? Uh, your, your, your past experience, your previous, uh, your, your heritage, your, your genetic disposition, predisposition, those things are not your authority. They're not the authority of your health, of your wellness, of your wholeness. Well, you know, we've had crazy women or crazy men in our, in our, uh, in our uh, family for generations. So, you've got to be crazy too? You know what I'm saying? I mean, really, there's people that have told me that. Well, you know, we've just had insane people in our family for generations. And all I've got to say is, you know, he is Jehovah Rapha. He is the Lord your sanity, not the Lord who gives you sanity. We're praying for stuff that he already is within us. I saw one of the fellows on Facebook, This, I think it was Ted Nelson up in Wisconsin. He said, he said, it sure is hard trying to become what I already am. That's a good statement, isn't it? Sure is hard trying to become what I already am. We've been doing that for so long. All right, so anyway, and, and, and look also at this. Didn't he also know, looking back at this uh, 26th verse, didn't he also know that he alone was the only solution For if you diligently, listen to this, if you diligently heed the voice of the Lord your God and do what is right in His sight, give ear to His commandments and keep all His statutes. Now listen, I can remember a time 30-some years ago when I listened to teaching that said that this was a requirement that the Father had placed upon me in order to be able to experience the blessing of healing and health was that I needed to be hearkening diligently. You know what? I heard the Lord, uh, you know, accurately probably once every three or four months back in those days you know what i'm saying so wow what hope did i have and i'm gonna tell you something i obeyed him even less because i wasn't hearing you know what i'm saying and so so here's the thing he he says if you diligently heed the voice of the lord your god and do what is right in his sight give ear to his commandments and keep all his statutes listen when he said that he knew that he alone was the only solution to that he knew that it was only his son 
that it was only by the sacrifice of himself that that was going to be fulfilled. See, that's why the Bible tells us, Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians 5 again, he said, or 2 Corinthians 10, I'm sorry, he tells us to take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. Not to the behavioral disposition of yourself. He said, take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. What Christ has accomplished for you and me in his obedience. Don't be thinking I'm not worthy of wholeness or wellness or completion because of what I've done. He's saying, take that thought captive and realize that what Jesus Christ did, he left everything dead on the seashore. You leave it there and go on forward understanding that I dwell within you and I am Jehovah, your wholeness, your wellness, your completion. All right? All right. <clears throat> so then, you know, he wasn't giving us here, you know, a, a set of some conditions that required, for, required of us for healing and health. But on the contrary, now hear me carefully, folks. On the contrary, he was actually declaring in this 26th verse that our behaviors are in no way associated with healing and wholeness. You got to get that. Our behaviors are in no way. That's exactly what he's teaching us here. He's showing us that you and I have no part to play as far as the production of the the event, okay? That our behaviors have nothing what to do with, with, uh, are not associated with healing and wholeness. Instead, they are fully a product of who he is. I want to let that sink in. Because, you see, even back then, the problem was not sin. It was sin consciousness. Yeah. It was sin consciousness. And I'll, I'll show you that a little more fully in a moment. So let's move on. Go with me over to the 23rd chapter of Exodus now. If, if every one of you could get a hold of what I just said, it would make a tremendous difference. Because when I say that your behaviors are in no way associated with healing and wholeness, I don't just mean the, 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 the times when you blow it and, and you're, 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 you're ugly, you're not so nice, you, you do the things that the church has classified for you as the, as the, the horrible sins, see? But I'm even talking about your behaviors of, of Scripture memorization and confession and fasting. And, you know, we, we're taught in the church you've got to fast to be healed. You've got you to give to be blessed. You've got to, you've got to, you've got to, you've got to in order to be. See? Again, sure is hard trying to become what we already are. All right, 23, verses 24 and 25 now. And again, most of us are familiar with the second verse I'm reading in each of these, but we haven't... Always put it in the context of the one prior to it. And I wanted you to see in that previous thing that God made himself the ordinance. He made himself the the statute and the ordinance. He said, I am making myself right now what you need. I have made myself what you need. I am the Lord your health. See? So I am the statute and the ordinance of health. Doesn't have anything to do with any of your behaviors. All right, now let's go on here. Chapter 23, verses 24. All right, now. You shall not bow down to their gods, nor serve them, nor do according to their works, but you shall utterly overthrow them and completely break down their sacred pillars. So you shall serve the Lord your God, and he will bless your bread and your water, and will take sickness away from the midst of you. Hmm. Well, verse 25 begins this way. It begins, so you shall serve. What those words mean is, in this way you shall serve the Lord your God. Well, what's he referring to? When he says, in this way you shall serve the Lord your God, he's referring back to what he just said. You shall not bow down to their gods, nor serve them, nor do according to their works, but you shall utterly overthrow them and completely break down their sacred pillars. And how easy is that for a legalistic mindset to put that responsibility back on you and how many times have you been have you been told or heard that that you are bowing down to the idols of this world that you are bowing down to to this god and that god by watching tv going to an r-rated movie you know having a drink of wine or 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 a whole bottle of wine oh anyway (laughs) well if you look around you on the tables you'll see that i have fulfilled my campaign promise i said if you would elect me pastor i would put a bottle of wine on every table And I'm sorry they're empty. They spent too much time at my house before they got here. (laughs) I meant for them to go straight from the store to you, but I'm sorry they just didn't make it. (laughs) 
No wonder he acts so ridiculous on Sunday mornings. No. Anyway. All right, but look at this. So he says, in this way you shall serve. So let's read verse 24 again. You shall not bow down to their gods, nor serve them, nor do according to their works. Now let me ask you, does, does that at all remind you of the encounter between Jesus and Satan in the wilderness? It should. When Satan said, you know, showed him all the kingdoms of this world, and he said, all of this and its authority has been granted unto me, and I give it to whomever I wish, and if you will bow down and worship me, I will give it to you. But Jesus did not bow down. We know that, right? Okay. So this verse should also remind you of Jesus. This verse should not place upon you a sense of responsibility that gets you busy looking around for where you've bowed down to some idol of this world or some, you know, you've made. I've even heard, you know, most of you have probably heard this. I remember years ago I heard somebody say, you know, that, that if, if I was just really, um, what I'm going to say, I don't want to use the word obsessing. That's not a good word. But uh, that, that if I, oh, I'll just be this way, that if I lusted after my wife, you know what I'm saying, that I was putting her before God. And i got to tell you something. I still lust after that woman. And I'm not going to continue lusting after her. And you know what? I've got God's seal of approval. He says, good for you, son. That's the way I created you. That's what I want, how I want you to be. See? Don't always be so pushy with her, but just, no. <laughs> but you know, I mean, they said that I was bowing down to, I was making an idol of my wife. I mean, I, they didn't say that to me, but I'm just saying that was the message that was proclaimed. I'm sure some of you have heard that. You know, you can make an idol of your husband or your wife. I think you should. I think you ought to love your husband or your wife, you know, so great. I, I, anyway, I don't need to go on with that, but you, you get the point, because that's kind of garbage we've heard over the years. And see, and it all comes out of these kind of verses. You shall not bow down. Well, again, I want you to see that this is Jesus, if you will, in verse 24, embracing humanity in his obedience. So verse 24 has been fulfilled by the Lord Jesus Christ so that you can enjoy the benefit. Now, again, the translators didn't see that. They saw you in verse 24 and a requirement that God was placing upon your life. And so consequently, when they get into verse 25 here, they write things in what I call, you know, the, uh, the, the future. Well, it's, it's the future tense. You see, if you will do verse 24, then he will do this. So I'm saying, if you don't bow down, if you don't serve them, if you don't do according to their works, but you utterly overthrow them, how many of us had much success in utterly overthrowing things? Now, thank God he did it, right? Okay. So you sh- in this way you should serve the Lord your God, and then he will bless your bread and your water, and, he will, and I will take sickness away from the midst of you. But you're going to have to perform. There are, there's a checklist that I've put before you, right? Say, that's the idea, but we need to understand that's not what's being said. All right? So when he says... So you shall serve the Lord your God. He's saying, in him you shall serve the Lord your God. In him. In him. See, you're in him. And that's how it did. Now, I want you to listen to just this this out of the Young's literal translation, this 25th verse. He said, and ye have served Jehovah. See that? And ye have served. Notice that it's now in the past tense. Let me read it to you out of the New King James. So you shall serve. But now the the literal translation says, and ye have served, past tense, and ye have served Jehovah your God. And look at, and he hath blessed your bread, thy bread, thy blood, (laughs) bread and thy water. He hath blessed, past tense. In other words, it was blessed before you got here. See? And so it certainly can't be the result of your obedience because he said he hath blessed ahead of time, before you got here. See? See? All right. And then he goes on and he says, now listen to this. Not I will take sickness away from the midst of you, but he literally says, I have, past tense, turned aside sickness from thine heart. Now this is literal, and I want you to get this. Notice that he did not say in the literal, I mean, you know, New King James says, from the midst of you, but the literal word there is thine heart. He said, I, will, I have turned aside Sickness from thine heart. So I want you to notice the association here between sickness with the heart, not with the body. See, as I've been telling you for a long time now, you know, sickness originates in the heart, 
not in the, not in the biology of man. See, we have believed that disease has its origin in the biology. But no, no, no. That's why we are not effective in dealing with it. Because we are dealing with it in the physiology, in the biology, rather than dealing with its source. You remember how God said over in Proverbs chapter 4, He said, you know, keep my words in the midst of your heart, for they are life to those who find them and health to all their flesh. He was talking about heart conditioning. He was talking about heart aerobics. He was talking about keeping your heart in such a condition that your life would experience health and physical life in your, all your flesh. See? And so here he's exposing the problem. He says, the problem that you had was disease of the heart. It was the disease of the heart. Let that sink in for just a little bit. Sickness and disease do not, did not and do not originate in the biology. I don't care what disease you're dealing with, what problem you're dealing with, it did not originate in the natural world. It originated in the, in the, in the spirit disposition of your own understanding. Hmm. So I can, you can paraphrase this verse like this. I have turned aside the disease of the heart. Not talking about cardiology problems, cardiac problems. He's talking about the, the true disease of the heart. So these two verses, when you take them together, you know, verses 24 and 25, you know, tell us that the disease of their hearts was that they associated their behaviors with their wellness or their lack of it. In other words, sin consciousness. Now, I'm reading backwards in these, okay, but I'm telling you that what, that what God was communicating to them and is communicating for our learning so that we might have a confident expectation of the good dealings of God in our life, okay, he's saying here that the disease of their hearts was that they, or let me put it this way, that, that you possibly, you know, associate your behaviors with your wellness or your lack of it. Again, behaviors can be all the things you must do, the scripture you must learn, the, 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 the things you must do of, an, of a righteous religious nature, as well as it might be those things that you're, excuse me, that you're doing wrong. See? Now listen, go with me just quickly over to Colossians 1.21, and we're coming right back here. But Colossians 1.21, Paul said exactly this, and I've, you know, I, I've harped on this passage for years in this church. Paul says, and you who once were alienated and enemies, everybody read it with me, in your mind by wicked works, yet now he has reconciled. What's that telling us? That's telling us exactly what I said God was communicating to these people in Exodus 23 there. It's telling us there that, that in their own minds, they had decided through the consideration of their wicked works that it was their works themselves that had alienated them and separated themselves from God. Let me read that again. You've got to get this. And you who once were alienated and enemies in your mind, in other words, you thought that you were the enemy of God, that you were separated from God, and how did you come to that conclusion? By the consideration of your wicked works. In other words, you began to consider, and you do today, some of you still. You know, you began to, to, to or we could just say your dead works, all right, let's just say you're dead works so that we don't, uh, so you know, again, don't just fixate on things you've done wrong, wrong, <laughs> but just realize that it may even be those things you've been determined to do good, good, so that you could be. Got it? All right, so Paul's talking about that same thing. All right, so back, back in Exodus 23, as I said, he said, He hath blessed your bread and your water. I have turned aside. So, in other words, one of the things that he's telling them back here in the progress of time here is he's, he's saying, you need to understand what I did back there at the Red Sea. He's reminding them again, you know, a few chapters, several years later, what took place back at the Red Sea. He said, I, I have blessed your bread and your water. All right? I mean, think about it. I have blessed. You know what these people have been doing by now? They've been drinking water from a rock and they've been eating manna. I've blessed your bread and your water. You need to wake up and realize that my past tense has become your present reality. That my past tense has become your present reality. My Jesus Christ, the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world, has become your present reality. And I have turned aside sickness, say, from your midst and so on. 
So he's saying, you know, you need to understand what took place. You need to go back and refocus and consider once again on things that have begun to slip from your understanding that you saw dead on the seashore. Wake up, church. It's time to see again and consider the things that are dead on the seashore and leave them there. Right? All right. Go with me over to Deuteronomy chapter 7. And we're going to look at uh, verses 12 through 15. Then it shall come to pass, because you listen to these judgments and keep and do them, that the Lord your God will keep with you the covenant and the mercy which he swore to your fathers. If you'll do this, then my covenant will work for you. Now, the implications there are horrendous. The implications there are devastating. They're 100% destructive. They predispose you for failure. The implications there from the legalistic perspective. Okay. Verse 13, and he will love you. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. If I don't do these things, you see, why do so many people in the body of Christ question the Father's love for them? Question the, the unconditional you know, love of the Father for them all the time. I'll tell you why, not just because of this verse, but because of the kind of teaching that comes out of this kind of thing. Well, you know, I I, I didn't listen to the judgments and keep them and do them, and the the Lord, my God, can't keep his covenant mercy with me, which he swore to my fathers, and he can't love me and bless me and multiply me. See? But it goes on. And he will bless the fruit of your womb and the fruit of your land, your grain, your new wine, your oil, the increase of your cattle, the offspring of your flock in the land which he swore to your fathers to give to you. You shall be blessed above all peoples. There shall not be a male or a female barren among you or among your livestock. And the Lord will take away from you all sickness and will afflict you with none of the terrible diseases of Egypt which you have known, but will lay them on all those who hate you. Well, Once again, Jesus is your verse 12, all right? Because he listened to the judgments of the Father, kept them and did them, and the Lord, your your God, will keep with him. See, the covenant that the Father made is with Jesus. You don't have a covenant with God. Jesus has a covenant with God, and you are in him, and so the covenant becomes your reality. Isn't that right? Because he's done these things. And he, he, he will keep the covenant and the mercy which he swore to the fathers. All right, so Jesus is your verse 12. You need know, to write that down in the margin of your Bible. Jesus is my verse 12. Jesus is my verse 24, whatever it was over there in chapter 23. Yeah, Jesus is my verse 20. Jesus is my verse 25 in chapter 15. You need Jesus, 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 Jesus. Amen. See, we need to get that. It's Jesus that hearkened diligently unto the voice of the Lord his God and kept all his statutes and obeyed his voice at all times. And because of that, we are included in him. And because we're included in him, all of these other things are just the natural revelation of our life in him. Okay? As I said, Jesus is your verse 12, but because the translators thought verse 12 was you, which they always do, They've translated these verses in the conditional tense. Now, I know that's not something you learn in English class. I call it the conditional class. I have some tenses that I've... I I have the finished tense and the conditional tense. See? The conditional tense is the if you do, it will be. All right? The finished tense is he has already done it, and you might as well just keep your nose out of his business and enjoy it. See? All right? So rather than saying present or, or, you know, or future... Or any of those, or, or past. I like to say finished and conditional. And so what they've done is they've con- translated everything in the conditional tense, and consequently, sin consciousness prevails in the church again, right? So I want you to listen to this text from Young's Literal Translation with the understanding, okay, that we were all crucified with him, right, from the foundation of the world. Deuteronomy chapter 7. Do we have it in Young's? Yeah, here we go. <clears throat> Well, I'll I'll tell you what, I'll go ahead and read it from up there because the print's bigger. (laughs) And it hath been because ye hear these judgments and have kept. Now, as we go through this, I know that, you know, we don't speak this way, but just keep noticing the finished tense or the past tense statements. 
Because this is literal Hebrew coming, you know, being translated, translated to English. And it hath been. Because ye hear these judgments. Can you hear Jesus? Can you hear the Father speaking to his son right now? Can you hear the Father speaking to Jesus? Can you hear him just speaking to you, or do you hear him speaking to Jesus? He looks at his son and he said, My son, and it hath been, because ye hear these judgments, and have kept, and done them, that Jehovah thy God hath kept to thee the covenant, and the kindness which he hath sworn to thy fathers. Verse 13. And hath loved thee, and blessed thee, and multiplied thee, and hath blessed the fruit of thy womb, and the fruit of thy ground, thy corn, thy new wine, thine oil, the increase of thine oxen, the wealth of thy flock on the ground which he hath sworn uh, to thy fathers to give to thee. Blessed art thou above all peoples. There is not in thee, there is not in thee, you know, let me keep that there, okay. There shall not be a male or a female barren among you. See, again, there's that conditional tense in the New King James. But here it says, There is not in thee a barren man or a barren woman, nor among thy cattle. And then finally, verse 15, And Jehovah hath turned aside from thee every sickness, already has, past tense, hath turned aside from thee. Jesus bore our sicknesses, carried our diseases, took them, you know, to the grave, rose without them. You see, having had Jehovah his Father had turned aside from him every sickness and none of the evil diseases of sin, which thou hast known, Jesus became sin in your behalf, And you became righteous. He knew sin, didn't he? He became sin. He said, the diseases of Egypt, you have doth he put on thee, and he hath put them on all, hating thee. Now notice in this verse, I'm just going to, this is a sideline, but uh, it it says, Jehovah hath turned aside from thee every sickness. Now the previous verse, that 14th verse, we can put that up there one more time. I want you to get this. Um, Blessed art thou above all the peoples, there is not in thee a barren man or a barren woman. And, and of course, the barren woman is, is the thing that I really want to focus on here. This word that's translated sickness in the 15th verse is a word that's not used a lot. It's a word that refers to, if you're going to take it literally, the sickness of menstruation. And so what he's really saying here is that he has removed from them every issue of every negative issue of ovulation and childbirth. But he's talking about the sickness. This word is used in sickness, uh, the sickness of menstruation. You see, and, and those of us who have been married a long time knows how it can afflict you, but us, right, men? <laughs> no. Especially if you raise daughters and wives at the same time, you know. No. <laughs> I don't have a jar up here today, so I don't have... They took my jar away. So I'm doing things on credit today. Those of you that weren't here last week or that watched online and wondered what in the world I kept looking back here for, last week they had a swear jar up here for me. I had to put money in it. But I didn't put any money in it last week. No, siree, I got through it. That's, that sin-conscious presence up here kept me on the straight and narrow. Praise God. <laughs> but anyway, going back again to just to verse, you know, verse 15, you know, it, it's, it's have turned aside... All sickness and disease, which was associated with Egypt and sin. That's what he's talking about. None of the, you know, the, the diseases of Egypt. All of, he said, I have turned aside all sickness and disease, which was associated with Egypt. All right. So it's true that sickness and disease, you know, was all associated with sin. No question about it. Because he's saying, I've turned aside from the every sickness and, and none of the evil diseases of Egypt, say, of sin. All right. So he's saying, I've turned aside. So sickness and disease was, in fact, as we already know, you know, associated with sin. But in what way was it related? This is what's important. What way was it related? Because it's been communicated, you know, as we've brought our Old Testament understanding forward. I believe the Old Testament understanding has been grossly, grossly, grossly off many times. We've taken so much out of the Old Testament and made it say what it didn't say either. And so that just really complicates the issue when it comes to understanding what the New Testament says. Amen. So what way was it? You know, was, because, you know, the, what was, was, was sickness and disease, for instance, was it just the uncontrolled, you know, release of sin into the world? 
Because if it was that, we need to realize, you know, that it would have been in full force and at maximum volume immediately. In other words, you see what I'm saying? It would have just been... But it, but, it, but it evolved. It developed. It didn't just instantly manifest. You know, we've said before, it took Adam 900 and some years to die. But you see, if, if, if sickness, disease, if all of this stuff, all these attributes of death, if they were just the, 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 uh, uh, the, the instant, uncontrollable release of sin's power upon people, then what would have happened was it, it would have all been just immediately. Boom. It would have just broken out with stuff. And, and you know what I'm saying? I want to get this down to what you need to hear, though. See, and lifespans would have shot right to the bottom. But, but it was gradual. It, it, was, it, was, uh, it, developed, it, it developed and it multiplied. Because sickness and disease was, in fact, the result of sin, but not of their doings. That's what God is teaching us here in Exodus. Sickness and disease was not a result of their doings, of their trespasses, the very things that, 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 that have been communicated to you that have effect on why you are experiencing what you're experiencing today. Hey, listen, we could put it into some other things. Hey, the reason you're experiencing poverty is because you're not tithing to your church. No, I'll tell you why you're experiencing poverty. You're experiencing poverty because you live in fear where your finances are concerned, and fear is, having, is exercising a greater influence over your life than faith. It's that simple. And fear always produces, in, in the area of finances, always produces selfishness. Hey, listen, I've been there. I've been there. I spent several years where I just, you know, I was just barely getting by, and it, get, and it struck fear in my heart to think about giving some of that away to anybody. Right? And so I got selfish. And you know, I got to tell you what happened. I didn't prosper during that time. And you know what? It had nothing to do with God's dealings with me. It had to do with my own fear of giving in the world, which would have produced its own result. What did Jesus say? He said, give unto others, do unto others, give unto others, as you would have them do unto you, not as you would have God do unto you. See, the message is you want God to bless you, you got to tithe. No, that's crap. No jar. Okay. I let, I, they had a list underneath that thing too, though, and, and that was a free word anyway. <laughs> because yeah, cause that one actually came from the Greek, I think, somewhere. No. You, you hear what I'm saying, though? We've had it put upon, so it doesn't have to be sickness and disease. We can talk about anything. You know, giving, you know, is the result of being fearless because you really do believe that God has blessed you. But giving does not release God to bless you. You got to get this, folks. It's so important, you know, because ministries in particular will will pound on you and pound on you and pound on you and convince you that you can't financially, economically prosper unless you are tithing and and even giving above and beyond tithe to your church or to where you're being fed, they say a lot. You know what? I give because Marilyn and I realize how blessed we are. And when we give, we don't give some, you know, a lot of times when we give, we don't give having anything much in the bank other than what we just gave. We don't give based on manifest balance in our checkbook or whatever like that. We give because we know what it says, that it was through his poverty we were made rich. And therefore, we give to bless other people, and we know that it's going to come back to to us in some way or another, probably. It may not come back in dollars and cents. It may come back in in somebody loving us when we need to be loved. Somebody being there for us when we need somebody to be there for us. We just put all these things in little categories, and we just sometimes don't really know how to value them. But anyway, let me get on with this. I'm sorry I spent so much time on that. but, But anyway... So, you know, if you're you're experiencing financial difficulties, realize that it's probably just because of fear, which always produces selfishness. And I don't take that selfishness as a condemnation from me. I don't mean it that way. It's what we do. We get, you know, we, we, we we get inward. I need to hang on to it because if I give it away, I won't have it. See? So just understand that. But it's not about God blessing you. So as I said, you know, sickness and disease was the result of sin, but not of their doings. It's, it, it was through the developed heart condition of behavioral association 
or what? Sin consciousness. And that's what began to happen right away. Adam began, Adam hid, right? And when God came looking for him, he said, I was afraid because I was naked, right? I was afraid. So we had fear right away. And so, you see, through that, he began to relate right away his doings to his relationship with God, didn't he? He began relating his doings to God's love for him. He began relating his doings to God's provision and God's you know, acceptance of him. And that's what happened. So it was a behavioral and it's a heart condition. And it's nothing more than sin consciousness. That's what Paul was talking about in Colossians. And he was talking about that mind sense of alienation that resulted you know, in their works you know, uh, re- relating their works to their experience with God. That's what Paul was talking about in Colossians 1.21. All right, and slowly, we can see it as we look at the genealogies of the Old Testament, you know, slowly that belief became the greenhouse for more and more unnecessary sickness, disease, and issues like that. It became a greenhouse where it could grow now, that, that heart condition. Remember, it's the, the disease of the heart. The disease of the heart is sin consciousness. That's all the New Testament talks about, is that the blood of, that, that the blood of Christ has, has cleansed your conscience from the dead works so that you can actually serve the living God. Amen. The worshiper having once, once, once been purified should have no longer any consciousness of sin, Hebrews 10.2. So as I said, you know, that belief became the greenhouse for more and more unnecessary sickness and disease. And I say unnecessary because you you want to remember that his purpose and grace was given to us in Christ Jesus before the world began, before time began. And what we see happening by demonstration in in, in Exodus is simply God's demonstration in time of what had already taken place in eternity, of what he had already done. He hath blessed. See, he has turned aside. What I'm trying to say to you this, listen, he's telling these people, before you knew me, I turned aside sickness and disease. But you've been allowing it to become a part of your life, see? You've allowed it to become a part of your life through sin consciousness, through the disease of your heart. While you were living in Egypt, there was a disease that was growing in your heart. And that disease is manifest in the, in, the, in the idea that your behavior has anything to do with my love for you and my provision for you, but I want you to know I am Jehovah your health. Amen. I am that I am. Amen. See? I mean, he's telling these people, and this is written for our learning, how much more ought we to have a working experiential revelation of this after the manifestation of Jesus Christ who this purpose and grace that was given to us in him before time began, but now hath been manifested, Paul went on to say in Timothy, in the coming of Christ. Okay? <clears throat> now, hidden in these two English words is a couple of things we want to look at, these words we've been dealing with, sickness and disease. And uh, I want to deal with them as we wrap up here. <clears throat> the word disease that, you, that we see most often, okay, it's number 4245 in your Strong's, okay? And it does come from a Hebrew word that was used primarily to reflect physical illness, physical weakness, physical pain. So, but then the word sickness is number 2483 in your Strong's. And th- this is really a much more far-reaching word. It's a br- much broader word. And, and I've taught on this once before, but I want, you to, I want to bring this to your remembrance because, like I said, I don't want you to just be grabbing uh, out of this today physical healing, but I certainly want you to grab that. I want you to put this in the context of no one takes my life from me. No thing takes my life from me. Nothing shall by any means hurt me. Those scriptures that we looked at several weeks ago, right? Okay. Sickness, though, is a word that means malady, anxiety, Grief and calamity. These are the things that this word means. All right, what is malady? Well, let me just give you some brief descriptions. Malady means to deprive of the energy or of the power to gratify desire. Okay? It means it's a, a malady is a disorder of mind or of understanding. It's any distemper or disorder. So that says something to you more than just physical sickness and disease, doesn't it? It starts dealing with the realm of the soul. It starts dealing with some of the things you think and so on and so forth. Anxiety. What is anxiety? Concern about events, future or or uncertain. None of us have ever had that problem, I'm sure. 
concern about events future or uncertain, and it's a concern that disturbs the mind and keeps it in a state of painful uneasiness. Now remember, these are words that he's saying, I have removed this sickness from your midst, from your heart. This stuff was in your heart. It's the product of your heart, and I have turned it aside in my son. Okay? State of painful uneasiness. It springs from fear or the apprehension of evil. Remember Jesus said I've, uh, that in, in, the, in the last days men's hearts will fail them for fear and the expectation of things to come or the apprehension of what might be. Right? Calamity is misfortune or cause of misery as a result of, of disaster, accident, anything that produces loss. Accidents. That would mean automobile accidents. That would mean falling downstairs. would mean cutting your finger. That's all just a joke for Cabby. She's not listening. <laughs> no. In other words, what I want you to get is that the word sickness is a, is a, is a, you know, reaches into every compartment of our life. So you know, we have this tendency to just grab onto small portions of things and not allow them to, be, to, to seek the revelation level that they want to seek in our life. We don't want to shut these things down. We need to let them fill our life with revelation so that our expectation, why were they written? So that we, through the scripture, these scriptures, might have an, a confident expectation, right? So the, this word sickness reaches into every compartment of our life, but remember the words of Jesus, you know, he has nothing in me because those are the exemptive words those are the exemptive words, you know, of immunity that apply to all these things. Now, remember, God has disassociated all these things from our behaviors. you got to get that out of here today. All of these things need to be disassociated. Now, this is important because, you know, I constantly beat myself up with the fact that I have financial problems because of stupid decisions I made. Well, now, you know, I, I did make some stupid decisions. There's no question about that. We're not saying I didn't. You know what I'm saying? But the point is, what I do is, then I disassociate myself from God's provision, from God being able to undo in me what I've produced. Now, see, we do the same thing with sickness, disease, with all of these things. We all have these tendencies, right? And so this message is preaching to me right now, too. <clears throat> but the legalistic judicial Christianity, you know, has worked overtime associating all these things with sin one way or the other. So on the one hand, God is saying, your behaviors have nothing to do with my wholeness and wellness and completion. But Christianity says just the opposite, right? So, and, and, and as I said, you know, sin consciousness doesn't mean only a sense of unworthiness for wrong behaviors. Sin consciousness also means a sense of elevated worthiness, you know, for good behaviors and habits. You know, it's sin conscious to have an expectation that things are going to go better for you because you've never tasted coffee, you've never had a cigarette, you've never drank booze, you've never done this, never said a swear word, never gone with a girl that did. That's sin consciousness. Amen. Give me my jar. Amen. No, I'll refrain. Jar's not here and I don't have any change, so I'll refrain. Okay. But as I said, you know, we've used our authority to lay down our lives in so many ways by accepting the idea that malady and calamity, you know, are, are something we all have to deal with. Listen, God will speak to you. If God doesn't want you on that airplane, he'll speak to you. If God lets you get on that airplane, enjoy the ride. Amen. If God doesn't want you driving down the interstate on an icy day, he'll speak to you. If he doesn't speak to you, go to Denver on the icy highway. Don't live in fear. Do whatever you, is in your heart. Do all that is in thine heart. For lo, I am with you, the Holy Spirit said to Jonathan. That's his armor bearer. Do all that is in thine heart. And if it's motivated by fear, then it ain't the Holy Spirit, okay? But we've just got to quit laying down our lives. We've got to quit depriving ourselves of the opportunity. We've got to quit, as I said, being deprived of the energy to gratify desire. I want to go somewhere. I want to do something. I want to be a part of something, but I can't because some fear has, has collapsed my heart. You know what? I don't have a better problem. Some of my kids, you know, have called me and say, you know, called me and mom. Hey, you know, we're going to fly. We're going to do this. Will you do that? Will you just, you know, pray and agree with us and find out what, you know, if God's speaking? And I'm always happy to do that. I don't have any problems with that. See what I'm saying? I'm not saying you shouldn't check things out with God before you do them. 
All right? See, but here's the problem. We don't believe the gospel. So let me read you four. Let's, let's look at four quick scriptures here as we wrap up, you know, because we need to begin taking back what we've laid down. And I just want to pump some insurance. John 17, 15. Let's get these up here and we'll take a look at them quick and we'll run through all four of them and you can just kind of grab onto them, write them down. I'd like for you to really write these down. Again, you know, I tell you to write down a lot of stuff and I wish you would. <laughs> I wish you'd take this stuff and, and, and get it out before you get it op- in the open. John 17, 15, Jesus said this. I do not pray, Father, that you should take them out of this world, <clears throat> but that you should keep them from the evil one. How many of you think God, Jesus, the Father answered Jesus' prayers? To keep you from the evil one, right? Look at 2 Thessalonians 3.3. 3. But the Lord is faithful. Everybody say the Lord is faithful. Who will establish you and guard you from the evil one. Paul apparently thought that the prayers of Jesus had been answered as well. Right? 2 Timothy 4.18. And the Lord will deliver me from every, everybody say every, every, every evil work and preserve me for his heavenly kingdom. The Lord will, he will, he will deliver me from every evil work, right? And then the last one. 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 5. You are kept, or the New, New, New American Standard is, is right in its translation as well, it says you are protected by the power of God through faith for salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. And, and as I've said to you before, for years I thought that was referring to I was protected by the power of God through my faith. And in my, No, but what the revelation here is that you are protected by the power of God because of what the faith of Jesus Christ has accomplished for you. And you need not live in fear. He will deliver you. Folks, it's so nice to believe that you're protected. It's so nice to be able to send your children to school every day knowing they're protected by the power of God. Knowing that it, that, that it doesn't have anything to do with your faith. But you know, it's in the knowing, not in the doing. If you can just know and just, you, you can rest. You can rest. There's no turmoil when you know. And you know, and you know. I mean, the knower is coming alive, folks. See? So anyway... All this was in the Exodus. Everything I just read to you was in the Exodus, you know, for our learning that we might have confident expectations. You get anything out of that? Amen. <clears throat> I want to also uh, just tell you just before...